All right, so it's my pleasure now to welcome our head coaches. First of the 11th ranked Ole Miss Rebels, Coach Lane Kiffin, and of the number 10 ranked Penn State Nittany Lions, Coach James Franklin. Will Coaches, will begin with an opening statement. Lane, start with you and, and just talk about how the week has been, the experience in general, and maybe how this uh, compares to other bowl trips that you've had. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this has been a great week. Our players and staff have um, had a blast, so many neat events. Um, so we thank everybody for putting those on. Hotel's been great. Uh, Georgia Tech's practice facility has been very helpful. So um, we're excited to be here. This is a huge challenge for us, um, playing one of the top teams in the country, one of the best coaches in the country, and number one defense by far in the country. So we have our hands full and um, very excited to be here and excited to be um, playing in this, this bowl and in this setting. All right. Coach Franklin? Yeah, ju just briefly, if you guys uh, don't mind, I'd like to recognize two of our, our beat writers. Uh, Pat Principe um, of WGAL-TV has been covering Penn State for 34 years. And David Jones from the Harrisburg Patriot News has been covering Penn State for 33 years. Uh, both are retiring, and this is their last game. I'm not sure. Are those guys here with us today? You mind standing up real quick? Appreciate you guys. Um, yeah, we've had, a, we've had a great experience. We've been here almost a full week. Uh, I've had a great time in the, in the city of Atlanta. Um, Chick-fil-A, Peach Bowl have been, have been phenomenal. Uh, I want to thank Georgia Tech as well, and Coach Keys allowed us to use their facility. We were there one day, and then we've been over in the stadium practicing the other days, which is a phenomenal facility. Um, so we've had a great experience, um, been treated in a first-class manner. The hotel's been great. I've had a chance to interact uh, with Lane, which has, been, which has been really good. We have a lot of um, coaches and friends in common, but we haven't really spent a ton of time together in the past. We were at the Dodd dinner last night, which was, which was a great event. Um, but we're excited about playing a really good opponent in SEC country. I've been a head coach in the SEC as well, so I'm very familiar and familiar, and got a ton of respect for Ole Miss specifically and the conference as well. And it should be a great game that's sold out, and we're looking forward to it. All right, thank you, Coach. All right, we'll go ahead and move into questions for the coaches. If you would, raise your hand. We'll get a microphone. Please give us your name and your affiliation and to whom you're addressing your question. Where are we going to start? Okay, let's start right here in front row on the left side. Hey guys, thanks for the time. Uh, Joe Smeltzer, Nittany Sports Now. Uh, James, now that we know that Saturday will be Adisa's last college game, what would you say about what he has meant to this program? And what's the biggest way you've seen him grow over his time at Penn State, whether that's on or off the field? Well, what I was happy about is that Adisa put that out on social media, and this was one of the few ones that Lane didn't didn't retweet with a smiley face because Adisa's <laughs> playing in the game, so uh, that, that that was good. But um, yeah, Adisa's a, a great Penn State story, you know, um, kid out of Canarsie High School uh, in New York um, has really come here come to Penn State and thrived. I think you guys all know his story and his family uh, really maximized his time and experience at Penn State. Um, I think he improved his stock um, as a football player over his entire career, but specifically this year, I think he's going to end up getting drafted really high. Um, graduated from Penn State, really just did it right. Was you know, We talk about high production, low maintenance, guys all the time he's he's a perfect example of that um but i'm a i'm a big adisa isaac fan his mom has been phenomenal through this entire journey as well um and i think he's just a really good example you know of, I, I i'm still a big believer in the the college athletics model and i think adisa is a perfect example of a young man that that took advantage of that and specifically penn state um, and I'm looking forward to watching him play this last game. I think he's going to, I think he's going to play really well. All right. We'll stay on the left side, second row. Hey, right here. Um, Jared Parker, six news. Uh, my coaches for coach Kiffin, uh, my questions for coach Kiffin. Um, some of the Penn state, uh, 
defensive players have taken note of your team's tempo? And I know uh, the Penn State defense versus the off Ole Miss offense has been a, a topic of discussion this week. What do you expect the Penn State defense to kind of throw at you to disrupt your tempo uh, tomorrow? Well, maybe James will answer that question for us. Um, I don't know. I think it's very complicated um, with new coaches, um, with with Manny moving on. So I think everybody, that first assumption is, oh, that's great for the opponent because the coordinator is not there. But that's also complicated because um, play callers have tendencies. So uh, we don't know what really to expect. Um, we know that it's a major challenge of uh, phenomenal players and a really good scheme. And, and I don't think the coach matters as a play caller. Um, under Coach Franklin, the defense plays really hard, regardless of who the coordinator is. And um, they have a special thing over there um, with, the, with the way that they play and the style that they play. So uh, th this is a huge challenge. All right, next question. Right. Fourth row on the left. Coach Franklin, uh, Gregor Paul. Excuse me? Gregor Paul. Gregor Paul. Look at Chris. What do you say? Gre the question is Greg or Paul? I, I'm not following you. Kincaid or Paul? For, for, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that really didn't uh, work out the way we had planned. I, I, I'm, it's early, and I haven't finished my first cup of coffee. K Kincaid, yeah. Kincaid. Yeah. This is uh, for both coaches. What have you guys decided in terms of will you or will you not have sideline iPads and also in helmet communication for this game? I'm yeah, so I'm still trying to figure out what that was. Was it like some uh, inside joke that yes. we were supposed to know? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I guess I, I, I was specifically. I'm still not totally. Okay. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think the way the NCAA set up the bowl was that, that both teams had to agree um, to use the technology. Um, and for whatever reason, you know, we have, we've not decided to do that, so we will not be using it from, from what I understand. Um, but that was, that was an option. Yeah, we, we decided on our side uh, not to. Just we're used to a system in college football, how it's been. And... Um, I don't know necessarily what the style that we play that would be as beneficial to us as maybe it would be uh, to some other people. All right, I'm staying on the left side in the third row. Uh, Rich Scarcella, Riding Eagle. This is for Lane and James. Lane, what have you seen from Penn State quarterback Drew Aller and James? What have you seen from Ole Miss quarterback Jackson Dart? Yeah, I think he does a phenomenal job taking care of the ball uh, first off and commanding the offense, getting the ball to the right place. And then when it's not there, breaks down, um, does a really good job of vertical scrambling and making plays and moving the sticks. So those guys are always really challenging because they're going to win a lot of games by the style that they play. They complete the ball. They don't turn the ball over. They don't make negative plays. So um, they've done a great job. Yeah, you know, Jackson and, and Ole Miss, I think the thing that jumps out from my perspective is, is balance. And a lot of times when you talk about balance, people think you're talking about running the ball 50% of the time and throwing the ball 50% of the time. And in the reality, they have done that too. Um, I think, you know, maybe their perception of Lane um, and Ole Miss is throwing the ball all over the field, uh, but they're running back. Is, is a challenge, and I think they do a great job of running the ball and running into advantageous looks. But the other thing when you talk about balance, in my mind, is also being able to spread the ball around the field, that there's not one receiver that you have to stop. They got three receivers that have all been really productive, probably the best combination of production at the receiver position that we've faced this year. Um, and obviously, they've, they've been able to run a ton of plays and that's a combination of tempo, but just as much tempo as it is is offensive success. They've, they've been successful, so they've been able to put drives together and, and get on the field and, and get off the field. So, um, you know, I think the quarterback has done a really good job of being able to make plays with his feet, being able to make plays with his mind, 
and be able to make plays with his arm and distribute the ball to, to multiple playmakers that, that Lane and, and their offensive coordinator have done a really good job of putting in, in, in really good positions to make plays. All right, we're going to go on to the right side in the fourth row. Uh, for Coach Kiffin, you've embraced social media and haven't been afraid to speak your mind publicly. Was there a, a moment in your career or something that happened that allowed you to feel comfortable start doing that more often? Yeah, actually, um, it started when a long time ago the NCAA uh, allowed us to direct message kids on Twitter, but we couldn't text on our phones. So um, that leads into a lot of rules that make no sense in the ones that we live in now. But um, so really, that's why why it started. So as a as a coach, that was your only way to communicate um, in certain periods of the year. And then it kind of just grew from there and, and really just, um, I think the reaction of, you know, you recruit so many kids out of your own area, no matter where you are, for the most part, that it's kind of a connection that sometimes when a parent comes to visit or you go into a home visit, maybe you haven't met them before and they feel like they have and they say, well, I love following you on Twitter. And, it, and it's kind of a, a starter um, where it all uh, kind of starts the relationship with someone and, um, you know, so I think in that way, it's been helpful for us. All right, take our next question right here, front row on the right. Hi there, Ali Baruby, Nittany Nation. For both of you, you're ending the regular season, heading into the Peach Bowl's top 12 teams. What does that say about the state of your program at the end of 2023 and how you can uh, take that into 2024 with a Peach Bowl win for either one of you? Well, I, th I think that, um, you know, it's been a really exciting season for us. Um, probably some similarities with um, two losses to two of the elite teams uh, in college football. And um, for us to be in a position in our program, having never won 11 games, um, you know, is really amazing for these players. And especially to me, the way that we built our team, um, whether it's right or wrong, is very heavy through the portal. And so a lot of new players. So I commend our coaches and our players of coming together. That's not very easy. Um, Otherwise, free agency, you know, these dream teams when people put them together in professional sports or NBA, they don't always work. And, and it takes some unselfishness because they all come thinking that they're going to, everything's going to go their way and then it doesn't. So they got to buy into the team. So I'm really proud of our guys. And then catapulting into next year, uh, we've had a lot of guys. Again, this calendar is, is, Nowhere in other sports, you know, we're in free agency and we're still playing a game here tomorrow. So we have players announcing they're coming back, announcing that they're coming in um, and leaving. So I think that we've had a really good, I say off season, but we're in season in that area uh, to lead into next year. Yeah, I think, you know, the way we ended last last season uh, with a Rose Bowl win, um, you know, I felt like the momentum uh, was a real positive for our program, whether it was recruiting, whether it was transfer portal, whether it was just a general feeling and excitement you know, with our fans, with the media, with our players in the locker room. Um, I think that was helpful. I think in some ways, obviously, a bowl game is, is the ending of, of the previous season. But in a lot of ways, you can also look at it as the start of the next year. Um, so you know, I think, I think our programs both um, are similar in some ways, but very different in others. Um, we have not been a big transfer portal team. We've been more of a, of a traditional um, high school recruiting team, but we, but we do accent our recruiting through the transfer portal. Um, you know, and we're excited. We're excited about you know, playing this game and playing this opponent and hopefully playing well enough that, again, we can have this momentum going into the offseason for recruiting, for spring ball, um, you know, for the confidence that a lot of players that are going to play in this game that maybe haven't had as significant of roles um, earlier in the season. So I think there's just a ton of reasons why this game is important for both programs and, and um, you know, looking forward, to, looking forward to playing it. All right, we'll take our next question all the way in the back. Uh, this is for Coach Kiffin, Andrew Clay, Nittany Nation. Uh, Coach, I wanted to follow up on something you said about preparing for Penn State's defense, knowing there's a different play caller. Uh, Anthony Poindexter has been a defensive coordinator at other places. Do you find there to be an advantage in studying how he's called defenses in the past at past jobs, or is that kind of irrelevant given that there's so many other circumstances? Again, I, I don't think you can figure that out because it's it's very 
abnormal. You know, normally um, coaching changes happen and they have spring ball, they have a whole off season. So when you open with somebody and you go to study where they were their coordinator before um, versus a place that, you know, just had a few weeks, um, you know, to prepare for this game. And also they've played so great in all situations on defense. I mean, the guess would be that there wouldn't be a whole lot of change, you know, um, when when they put their players in such good position and played so well. So uh, I don't really know that answer. All right, next question also in the back. Hi, this is for both coaches. I'm Dave Jones from Penn Live, way in the back. Um, with the transience of the portal and opt-outs, uh, just recently in the last few years, have either of you guys embraced any kind of overall philosophy about keeping the team engaged, keeping everyone together? Has it been more of a challenge or not for, for bowl games and prep for bowl games? Yeah, you know, we were discussing it a little bit last night, to be honest with you. I think, I think that's the challenge, right? This is, this is new. This is new to all of us. And it's, and it's really changed year by year. Um, transfer portal windows, uh, NIL, I think uh, all, all these things have changed. So I think that's one of the more difficult things is I think in, in the previous structure, you could kind of rely on, on past experiences, but this has been a moving target. Um, I think we're both trying kind of different approaches and trying to figure out what is the best thing for, for both of our programs. Um, but I think it's a challenge for everybody right now. This is, this is, I think, one of the more challenging times in, in college athletics and specifically football, um, specifically when it comes to, like Lane mentioned, the calendar, um, you know, and um, the bowl games specifically, and obviously the information that the players are, are getting from multiple you know, resources. All right, next, all on the camera platform in the back. Back here. Uh, Lane, through these practices this week and the last couple of weeks, I know you've always mentioned, you know, how much is at stake to become the first team to win 11 games and continue this momentum with recruiting, all that stuff. But from the player side, how would you kind of assess their, their sense of urgency throughout these, these practices for this game? Yeah, to finish the second part of that question, um, because you look frustrated that you didn't get the other part. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying this because he's here. I think that Penn State and Coach Franklin really has been a model of whatever they do of how to do this as far as guys not going in the portal, guys not opting out for games. Um, and they've done a phenomenal job over the years of it. Um, so I think that's rare nowadays. I think that um, I've been very critical of the calendar, been very critical of the system, even though we try to obviously maximize the system. Um, but, but it's really not good. And talking with a lot of coaches over the last two weeks, um, there, there's been a lot of struggles, and, and, it's, and it's a poor system. You, you, know, you don't have free agency during the season. That doesn't happen. And so um, with no parameters around it, and that's what we're dealing with. And talking to coaches around the country, dealing with players coming in, and, um, you know, they're going to opt out for the game or they're going to transfer if they don't play this many plays or they don't get this much money. I mean, well, what are we talking about? You know, um, so again, you got a system that is not going to get better till it gets fixed. It's going to get worse um, because ask NFL teams, um, you know, if they were getting ready to start the playoffs, would they ever put free agency right before it? Um, and not just players negotiating for the next season, negotiating whether they're going to play in the playoffs. So um, it's a very poor system. All right, next question here, back row on the right. John Sauber, Saturday Daily Times. James, is Johnny Dixon with the team, and do you expect him to play on Saturday? Yeah, so uh, Johnny Dixon is not with the team currently, um, and so obviously we don't anticipate him to play in the game. All right, staying in the back row on the right. Audrey Snyder with The Athletic. This is for both of you guys. Uh, Lane, you called it a, a poor system, the calendar. James, I know we've talked before um, about it. I guess how would both of you guys go about potentially altering this calendar and what concerns do you have about next year considering the timeline gets gets changed with the playoff semifinals and all that as well? Well, that, that to me is a long discussion in, in a lot of different areas, um, whether that's the calendar, whether that's um, their employees, uh, do they have real contracts, do they have 
public contracts that we would all know what they were, um, you know, like professional sports. So um, to me, that, that's a long conversation of a lot of different areas of a system that's, that's very broke. Um, but again, I'm not complaining, don't get me wrong. We try to maximize the rules and what they are to create the best team that we can, the most competitive team. But it's, it's really, uh, again, you just heard my kind of speech on it. It makes no sense and it doesn't happen anywhere in professional sports um, to have a system like this. Um, where again, you have free agency that now you can go in whenever you want um, and you can go in multiple years and change teams whenever you want and you can change before postseason happens. So um, I don't know why that's, that's really good and it certainly isn't good for academics as they continue to transfer, continue to lose credits. So um, this was, in my opinion, not thought out at all. And now a two-time transfer um, was really not thought out. Yeah, I think, you know, Chip Kelly made some comments a few weeks ago. And I think he said some things publicly that, that a lot of coaches have been talking about privately for, for a while. Um, you know, I think, I think Lane obviously brings up some, some really good points as well. I think at the end of the day, and, and I've said this before, I think the reality is, you know, a, a commissioner of college football would be valuable. I think there's a reason for a commissioner of college football to be able to work with the commissioner of the NFL because I think the NFL should be working with college football. Um, and then I think the commissioners of the, of the major conferences really all need to get into a room together. Um, and really spend some time working through all these issues. And I think Lane's point is, is a good one. We could talk about this for a long time, but right now, the way I see it, the, the commissioners of the conferences um, are the best people to solve, solve these problems. Get them all into a room together. Uh, you could have representation from the NCAA as well, uh, the NFL, um, and sit down and, and really start from scratch. A whole new calendar, a whole new model, uh, recommendations and I think that's really how this is going to get done moving forward but it needs to happen and I think it needs to happen quickly right now there's there's no parameters there's no guardrails um, and I don't really feel like it's in anybody's best interest and I think to Lane's point I don't want it to be misinterpreted um, I've been supportive and I think most college coaches have been supportive of, of the players um, you know being able to earn I think I think everybody would agree with that, um, but I think right now there just needs to be some parameters, and um, everybody needs to be kind of working under similar um, constraints. I think that would that would make a ton of sense uh, for everybody involved. And I think me and Lane came up in this profession where it was started. The starting point was based on on education, and right now. There's not one rule or decision being made ba based on education. And I think there's a way to really balance both and be able to get both things done. All right, over here on the aisle on the right. Uh, Jeff Nyberg, Philadelphia Inquirer. This question's for James. Uh, you guys have had a lot of success, been on a lot of these New Year's, New Year's Six games, but the last couple of years, obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, haven't gotten over the Big Ten hump at the, at the top. How do you balance that success with, with that reality and where the program is, and how much are, are you looking forward to an expanded playoff? Yeah, well, I, I think the first thing, you know, when you're at a place like Penn State, you you embrace, you know, the expectations. Um, you know, that's that's why you came here, um, and that's for our players, and that's for the coaches, and 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 that's for myself. So, you know, we embrace the high expectations, um, but I do also know um, that we take a lot of pride in the in the consistency and and how we've been able to play. Um, over the majority of our time at Penn State. And I think sometimes people take that for granted and don't realize how challenging that is in, in today's college football. So um, for us, it's, it's being appreciative and recognizing what we have done well, but then also taking a deep dive and, and being very, very transparent. Um, and saying where do we need to grow, how do we get better, and, and how do we attack those things. And I think one of the things I've been pretty vocal about is you know, really our first year um, with alignment you know, from the chair of the board to the president of the university to the athletic director who played football in the Big Ten 
uh, and myself, um, this, is a, this is a situation really in my 10 years that we have not been in. And I think that's, that's going to put us in a, in, a, in a very powerful position moving forward. All right, all the way back in the platform. Joseph Doring, WLBT. Coach Kiffin, uh, your career has taken you from West Coast to East Coast, now obviously here at Ole Miss. You've had a lot of experience in these past two decades, but just to be able to get here today, if, this, if it were this time next year, we would be talking about a playoff. But right now, if you'll just take me through what it's like to be a head coach and how you got here to this point. Well, I've, I've been very fortunate and, and blessed to have a lot of opportunities. Um, grew up in the profession with my dad and um, got a lot, a lot of opportunities because of that. And then to be able to work for some amazing coaches and be offensive coordinator on national championship teams for Pete Carroll and Nick Saban. Um, so I'm very fortunate that way. And, um, and then just been able to um, continue to grow and learn. I think that you know, there's probably a lot of things I don't do well or we don't do well as a program, but I think we do evolve well and we change and um, we think outside the box, uh, you know, change with the rules, whether that's, you know, the plain rules of, of the game and our offensive system or whether that's the portal and transfers and NIL. So um, I credit our coaches a lot with that. All right. right side about halfway back. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this question is for James uh, Tyler Downey from Lines 24-7. Um, you were able to get your coordinators on board here in December. Now that that process is about done, what have you accomplished with Andy and Tom respectively this month with getting them on campus and down here in Atlanta? Yeah, I think like Lane mentioned, you know, it's not ideal. Um, obviously, we'd prefer to be in a situation where, um, you know, our staff was still, still in place. Um, you know, obviously we've had turnover at both positions or change at both positions for different reasons. Um, but I think the value of having these guys here, um, not in coaching roles, I think is going to allow the transition to, to go um, smooth. Um, I, I, we did this when we hired Manny. Uh, Brent Pry left to go be the head coach at, at Virginia Tech. Um, and Anthony Poindexter was in, in a position to call the defense and be the defensive coordinator in the interim and did a phenomenal job. But I think Manny being with us, <clears throat> building relationships with the players, getting familiar with the staff, understanding the culture and how we operate from an organizational perspective, I think really allowed him to hit the ground running the day after the bowl game. And I think you know, the model that we're using with both coordinators, you know, during this bowl prep period. I hope we don't have to do it again, but but I did think there was value in it last year and talking to both you know, Tom and Andy, I think they think it's been invaluable. Um, things that they like, things that they, um, you know, have questions about, we're able to kind of work through those things and I think it'll be really valuable for us moving forward. All right, we're going to go back to the left side in the second row. Coach Kiffin, this is Kyle Golick of Mike Farrell Sports. Um, many in the media, including myself, have dubbed you the Portal King. And through traditional recruiting, you usually have top 20 classes. How do you, how do you balance the needs for both with, between the Portal and recruiting? And do you feel through that balance, Ole Miss can get over the Alabama and Georgia hump in the SEC? <clears throat> Well, I don't think many people have gotten over that hump. So I know that we get criticized, um, you know, when you don't get over the Alabama hump and um, Georgia. But um, really, outside of the one LSU year, um, I don't know many people have. But in my opinion, you know, you build a roster, you know, like you build a roster different depending on where you are and a lot of variables. And um, where we are at Ole Miss, I just feel that this is the best way to do it. We're very heavy portal, probably is, you know, um, <clears throat> whatever top 10% of um, teams. And I just think that's the way to do it where we're at. And that may change someday, um, even where we're at, as we maybe experience more success on the field in games like this and um, are able to sign more um, five-star type of high school players. So it just is what it is now, and I think eventually the rules will change some too, and we'll just continue to evolve with that. And th there's a good and bad to all of it, you know. Um, ideally, the traditional model 
uh, is the best if you can do that. If you can sign great high school players, 25 of them, and build that way. But <clears throat> I also don't know that that's going to work quite as well um, as I think us coaches would all like it to work because of the transfer and because of the, you know, the kind of five-star syndrome. So now those guys sign in the top classes that are celebrating on signing day, I don't think that celebration is probably quite as much as it used to be, um, at least down in our area. Like I said, James has done the best job of keeping players, probably anybody in the country. But a lot of these others, as you look at the classes the last two years, these five-star guys aren't paying off. You know, they're getting them into their program. Let's be honest, they're paying a lot of money for them. And then when it doesn't go exactly right, they're in the portal and they're going to someone else. So. I think that there is no exact way to do it, and you got to do it different depending on where you're at. All right, back to the middle of the platform in the back. Lena, you, you were just mentioning that Alabama Georgia hump, and, and this question's for for both of you coaches. Do you kind of see similarities in the two of your programs in Ole Miss and Penn State, kind of being close to the top of that conference and kind of working your way to to get over there to you know be at, at the number one kind of spot? I guess starting with you, Lane. Well. Penn State and Coach Frank, they, they've been doing this for a long time. You know, he's been um, in these type of games for a long time. Uh, I think I read something where maybe the only team that could win all of them um, for all the New Year's Six Bowls. So um, we're kind of new to this. And, um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a big challenge. Uh, you know, those are two of the top programs in the country. And like I said off the top of my head, I mean, outside of, you know, going to ask Ed Ogeron and Joe Burrow, um, in the last 10 years, who's really gotten over that hump of those two. So, um, you know, we'll just continue to work at it. But like I said, they, they've been up here for a long time as top 10 teams. And, um, you know, we happen to be up here for our second time uh, in three years. So we'll just continue to work at it. All right, left side, third row. Yeah, the Neil Riddell from the Altoona Mirror uh, for James. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, that, Kalen, you have him for one more game. Just curious now with Johnny, uh, how you'll manage the time in the secondary. Uh, how we'll manage the time the, and the playing time. Who else are you counting on in the secondary? Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll play all the other guys that have that have played this year. They'll have a more significant role. Um, you know, I think, you know, that's going to be in some ways an opportunity and an exciting opportunity for them and for us. Obviously, it's going to be challenging because the type of wide receivers and offense that we'll be playing. Um, but these are the guys that we're also going to be, you know, depending on you know next season. So uh, it creates you know some more opportunities in this game, and and we've embraced it with a next man up mentality and. Again, you know, we're not the we're not the only program that's that's dealing with a little bit of this. I'm sorry, Coach. Did I step on your toes there a minute ago? Did you want to address no, the previous I, question? Yeah, I think it was a previous question, but to be honest, now I forgot what it was about getting over the hump. Oh yeah. So um, I, I think in a similar way that that Lane mentioned that I think up till the last two years we were the only other team in the Big Ten that have that had won a Big Ten championship. Um, so it, it is challenging, and, and, um, but I also think there's that fine line of, of what we've discussed is uh, winning 10 games, winning 11 games in a conference like the Big Ten uh, or in the SEC um, is, is more challenging on a consistent basis than, than I think people realize. Um, and then after that, it's, it's being very, very transparent and um, honest with yourself uh, and your entire program of what you need to do to take that next step, whether it's, whether it's you know, recruiting at a higher level out of high school, whether it's going more into the transfer portal. I think Lane's point was a really good one. The, the high school model really only works anymore if the players and their parents will stay and allow them to be developed. If, 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 you, if you put all your time into high school prospects, but they won't have the patience and take the time to allow you to develop them, then all you're really doing is developing them for somebody else's program. So that's, that's the challenge. You know, I hear high school coaches and, and sometimes players being frustrated that some programs are being more portal heavy. Um, well, I think that's part of the discussion that needs to happen. Are you gonna, are you gonna come here and, and allow yourself to be developed over four to five years 
Um, the problem is none of them see themselves that way. They, they all think they're going to be the, the three-year model. So it's challenging, and I think all of us have to look at our programs uh, specifically and the regions of the country that we're in and, and, and what's going to be what's going to be in our program's best interest moving forward. Uh, and they're not easy discussions. All right, we've got time for a few more. We'll go next to the front row on the right. Hey, Lane. Hey, James. Uh, Megan Hall with USA Today and For the Win. I wanted to ask both of you these questions because I asked your players and your staff, no pressure, because they had great answers, so I'm counting on both of you. Uh, James, for you, Wawa or Sheets? Mm. So that's, you're putting me in a tough spot. It's kind of like uh, we're in central for everybody in here that maybe you know, doesn't cover Penn State closely. We're in central Pennsylvania, so right in the mid or middle of the Eagles and the Steelers. And I grew up just outside of Philadelphia, so I'm a Wawa guy. But now I live in central Pennsylvania, and it's Sheets. Lane's looking at me like I'm crazy. He probably doesn't know what Wawa or Sheets is. Um, but I, I think I, I got to stay with Wawa. I got to stay with my roots and uh, kind of where I grew up. Um, but I have really um, learned to appreciate Sheets uh, being in central Pennsylvania. All right, Lane. So and, I, and I'm willing to negotiate <laughs> if Sheets or Wawa would like to work with our players moving forward. Uh, with some NIL opportunities, I think uh, I'm, I'm willing to negotiate. And if they don't, if they don't, you know, respond his negotiations the way he wants, he's not going to coach the game tomorrow. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we deal. That's what we deal with now. Uh, All right, Lane. Question for you is: I obviously know you're a huge Taylor Swift fan, and I asked your team about it. Yeah, I just saw you blink. I know. I'm sorry. Um, but I asked your team what their favorite Taylor Swift song. So that same question to you, and can you sing it for us? I can't sing, and nor will I right now. Um, Lane, we all think you should, though. I know. I know. Um, I, I don't know. She's got a lot of great songs. I just think she's really amazing that she can connect to so many people. And, um, you know, I kind of think a lot of times movies, songs nowadays, it's like how fast can people pump them out and make money? And I feel like... Um, hers, she takes a lot of time and there's a lot of meaning in them and they can relate to a lot of people. So, um, I, I don't know that I can pick just one. All right, we're going to go left side, about five rows back. Uh, question for both coaches, uh, Shane Thomas with CNHI. Um, James, uh, you talked about the Martin Luther King uh, Museum for your players and that experience for you. Um, how, how has that experience been for you and, and how significant is it for you? And Lane, uh, what, what has kind of been your, your favorite experience from the bowl so far? Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting because it's, it's kind of going back to, you know, what we talked about earlier with, I think, the challenge with college athletics and specifically college football. And when we got into the profession, a huge part of that was the educational component. And I think that's being de-emphasized with a lot of the rules that are, that are being passed um, or changes in rules that are, that are being passed. And I think whenever you can take time with your team to pour into them experiences uh, and opportunities like being able to go to the Martin Luther King uh, exhibit was powerful. You know, I think the bowl, you know, had it as an optional experience. We, we made it kind of mandatory for our team. We didn't tell them that it was optional. We just kind of put it on the schedule and went. And I think it was great for all of our players. I know it was great for me personally, as much as I, I feel like I knew a ton about Martin Luther King and the background and the significance for our country uh, and race relations. You know, I learned a ton myself at, at 51 years old. Um, that I didn't know and being able to go into the Ebenezer Baptist Church and take that all in was, was powerful. Um, to think about that time in our country as a black man at 35 years old uh, to win the Nobel Peace Prize is, is, is amazing. Um, but I thought it was a, a great experience for our coaches. I think it was even more pow powerful for our players. A number of our players had been there before. Um, but also, I think through the bowl, we were able to get maybe a, a, a different and more significant experience with the tour. 
uh, which was also great and, and very, very appreciative. So, um, and we've been fortunate on a lot of these different types of trips uh, to be able to, to gain some perspective and some experience. So it was powerful for us, and I'm glad we did it, and I would do it again. All right. Coach Kiffin, your, your favorite experience? Yeah, I thought that um, both teams being at the College Hall of Fame um, with so much tradition and history there and being able to see that, but then um, to have a competitive environment where they were playing a game show. And um, it was really it was really neat to see guys be comfortable and um, be competitive in that environment. So um, I thought that was pretty cool to be part of. All right, we'll end it there. Coaches, if you would, we're going to uh, do some quick photos um, here with the trophy and Gary and Bob. Couple more. All right, in the middle, can you guys get good? I, I need a, I need a clean camera shot in the back, please. During the aisle, can you scoot down? 